Hi, I'm Aaron, and this is Exploring Elixir Extra for episode number seven. So I want to talk about three things in this extra. Um, the first one is a little bit of an update to the last episode, episode six, where we talked about multi-tenant applications. Um, in particular, I wanted to just touch really briefly on how migrations work um, and a better way to get at the prefix that we looked at in that episode. So. First of all, um, Triplex, as we used in the in that episode, uh, provides a mix plugin that gives us this mix Triplex, and in there we have gen migration, migrate migrations, and rollback, and these are modeled exactly after what happens in Ecto. Uh, the difference being that these get applied per tenant, and these create gener uh, migrations and pull migrations from that tenant migrations directory that we saw in that episode. So to create a new uh, tenant migration, so something that should be migrated per tenant, we just run Trivlix gen migration. It takes the exact same command line options that Mix Ecto gen migration does. So if you use Ecto, you know how to use Triplex. Just have to use Triplex for the, um, the tenant migrations. Now, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, I was looking at the process dictionary to grab the prefix out of um, the uh, Ecto migration. And it was pointed out to me, rightfully so, uh, there's a better way of doing this, much simpler way actually, and that is simply to call ecto migration dot prefix. I, I don't know how I missed that in the documentation. It's been there since ecto two, um, so yeah, this is a much easier way to get at that that uh, prefix. You can just call this, and it does exactly the same thing um, as what I had shown in that episode. So enough about multi tenancy. The second thing I want to talk about is the um, some of the caveats with airline distribution. So we had um, done some auto clustering. Um, and I mentioned there that there are some issues with security and uh, scalability. So just to talk really quickly about it, if you look at the security section in the distribution uh, part of the Erlang um, uh, documentation, it mentions that it uses a magic cookie, which is an Erlang atom, and that's pretty much all it describes in terms of security. That's because that's pretty much all there is. Um, once something can connect to your cluster, they can communicate with any node. There's no security within the cluster itself. It's up to you to provide, if any. And even then, when something comes and connects to the uh, EPMD, the airline port mapper daemon, or otherwise somehow is, is knocking on your cluster's door, um, by default, this is not done using any sort of security. So there's a really great blog entry from 2016 uh, middle of last year on the Airlang Solutions blog. I'll link to that in the, in the description below. And it talks about um, using TLS. And so you can do TLS, um, encrypted connections for the for the cluster. Um, this provides, you know, in, induces some overhead. So if you're on a private network, you don't need this. So, you know, if you have your LAN with a firewall you control in front of it, you probably don't need any of this. Um, but if you're running it on someone else's network or, or heaven forbid, on the public internet, um, you definitely want to be doing this. So it walks us through how to use TLS distribution, um, but it also notes that by default there's no verification, so you can. it's really easy to man in the middle. Uh, well, we can do verification, and it shows how here, um, and yeah, to verify against a CA list, etc. We can even do custom verification functions, starting with uh, the ERTS, or Airline Runtime System, version 19. We're up to 20 now, so it's been there for a whole version. Um, and then they do mention um, down below about EPMD, and they actually do reference the um, start e EPMD and EPMD module that we actually used in episode seven to replace EPMD completely. And again, the reason why you might want to do that is because EPMD is not designed with security in mind. It's fine on a private network, but if you're using it on the public internet uh, or someone else's network for that matter, you probably don't want to be using EPMD. And they explain why really well in this in this um, uh, blog entry. So if you are doing uh, clustered Erlang on somebody else's network or the public internet, I really recommend that you read this blog entry very carefully to uh, cover yourself. Finally, um, there is an interesting issue with scalability. So uh, there was a paper that was published actually this year in August in the IEEE Transactions on Parallel and Distributed Systems called Evaluating Scalable Distributed Airlang for Scalability and Reliability. Um, it is something that they've been working on for, uh, our research group has been working on for a fair while. 
um, to address an issue with scalability. Now, what is that issue? We all think of Erlang as being super scalable and therefore Elixir inherits that and Elixir is super scalable, right? Well, when you create a cluster, it does so in a full connected mesh. So as they point out, full connectivity means that the total number of connections in the system is n times n minus one over two, fair enough, and every node supports n minus one connections. So it says, in addition, every connected node requires a separate TCP IP port and node monitoring is achieved by periodically sending heartbeat messages. In small systems, maintaining a fully connected network is not an issue, but when the number of nodes grows, a fully connected network requires significant resources becoming a burden that worsens the performance. So if you're running a you know 50 node, 100 node cluster, this is probably not gonna reach out and bite you. Um, you're probably not gonna notice. But as you start getting um, a larger number of nodes, um, you know, above that kind of 100 marks, what I understand where it starts to kick in quite, quite heavily and hard, um, or if you have just a, a lot of cores and you're running, you know, different VMs on those cores as well, that'd be, that'd be the same thing as different nodes. Um, you, you know, you run into a scalability issue. You may even, I suppose, under certain circumstances, find that that meshing um, is causing more overhead than you'd like. So they've been working on a solution for this. Like I said, for most of us who have, you know, small, I use that in quotation marks, clusters of just, you know, maybe a, a handful or a few dozen nodes, it's not going to be an issue. But for larger systems, they've been working on this scalable distributed um, uh, version of, of uh, the Erlang runtime system. And this slide from the presentation they pre uh, did recently um, by the author, the main author of that same uh, uh, white paper or research paper, sorry, um, really outlines what they're doing differently. So on the left, we can see the fully connected mesh that is typically how an Erlang system clusters itself and then showing how they're doing it. Basically, they're segmenting the network um, down. It's not the only way you have to like move to this more radical approach, which I hope will one day actually make its way into Erlang proper. Um, there is another um, approach and that is using hidden nodes. And so you can um, uh, connect to a cluster using the hidden option when you do connect to the node. And what that does is it doesn't put it into the full mesh as we see here, but just creates a point to point, one node to one node connection. It does then at that point leave it up to you. They're not transitive. You have to handle all of the distribution, failover, routing of messages yourself. But sometimes that can be a valid solution where you can have uh, two sub networks of a cluster connected via hidden nodes. And it's a, it is more work and, and for most of us not going to be worth it, but at times it can be. So something to keep in mind that there is a hidden mode. But again, as I, as I say, I really hope that uh, this scalable distributed approach, so something that doesn't rely on a full mesh system, uh, one day makes it into Erlang proper. So those are the three things, I or two of the three things I want to talk about. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was a little bit about the Git repository itself. So I've been kind of, you know, playing with how I want the Git repository uh, that goes along with exploring Lecture to be laid out. So at the top level, it looks like pretty much any other um, Elixir project. I'll actually move the, uh, the dump there. Uh, and if we go into um, lib, there's a um, Acto bench and an exploring Elixir. I haven't covered the Acto bench thing in a, in a uh, uh, episode yet. I, I'm not sure if I will, but maybe. The, the important stuff is in Exploring Elixir. So first of all, there's the Exploring Elixir main module. And in there, there are functions for most every episode. And those will actually, if you run them, they will at least set up the things necessary to play with the, the things that we've looked at in that episode. So for instance, um, Ecto perf starts the the Postgres application. Um, episode seven starts the the um, lib cluster application. Um, same thing with episode six and ensures that Postgres is is install is started. I'm not starting every dependency automatically. In fact, I'm starting dependencies manually so that if you are playing with this and you do iex s mix um, to start it, you're not going to get 18 million things started. And if you don't have Postgres started, um, you know it's not going to give you errors unless you're actually trying to do something that uses Postgres here, um, such as in episode six. Um, so it just makes it a little bit faster, lighter, and, and less error prone uh, when you want to run it. So that's how you can kind of bootstrap what we cover in each episode. And then inside the Exploring Elixir uh, directory, there's the application, which is our top level supervisor. But then there's a folder for almost every episode. Episode five didn't have one because we looked at something 
that didn't require code here. Um, but pretty much every episode has a subdirectory and inside there, so if we go into seven, um, inside there you'll see the code that relates to um, that episode. And that's kind of how I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with it. Um, if you don't use the those bootstrap episode one, two, three, four, five, six, seven functions, um, you can also come into mix.exs um, and right where it says up a little bit, right, um, the applications, it says applications mix env, um, and I'm not starting anything here. So you can really just remove this line um, right here and start it and it will start all the dependencies. Um, it may complain about not having Postgres and a few other things if you do so, depending on what code you run. Um, but yeah, caveat emptor. So that's um, basically how it's being laid out. Otherwise, the tests are in tests. There's not a lot of them because this isn't a real project. Um, and there is no overall coherent structure to this. It, it really is uh, just about showing episode by episode um, code. So I just want to make that a little bit clearer. Um, fixes, improvements, suggestions, you know, pull requests, you have them even on the Git repository are, are very welcome. Um, and I'll be continuing to um, add to this uh, over time, per episode, in fact. So thanks again for uh, watching. I hope you're getting something out of this and, and enjoying it as much as I am enjoying making them. Um, spread the word about Elixir. Um, and let's yeah grow the community and do great things. So I will see you in the next episode, number eight, uh, coming up after this weekend. Cheers.